good afternoon. Unit 1 will put you at ease by telling you it's question 2, and we will work on that with you as soon as we have had an opportunity to meet you, your teacher, and you've had an opportunity to meet us. Please start. Good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth Schluter. I am Ben Sederdahl. Hi, I'm um, uh, Grant uh, Sigmund. Uh, our um, judges are um, Mr. Uh, Becca and um, Mr. Marshall Chalked over there. Hello. And thank on, you the, for I'm on, on behalf of Unit you know, 1, we'd like to thank you for being here today. We thank you. My name is Amy Dudas. I'm an attorney in private practice in Richmond, Indiana, and I'm the president of the Indiana Bar Foundation. Sue Leeson, Senior Justice Oregon Supreme Court. Lindsey Draper, retired from the juvenile bench in Milwaukee County, Wisconsin, and periodically I drop into the state of Illinois to judge the Illinois finals. Mm -hmm. yep. yep, they say. <laughs> <laughs> Question two. Our system of government is based on both natural rights philosophy and classical republicanism. Which philosophy, if either, has predominated in American political thought, and what have been the benefits and costs of this predominance? What examples of contemporary issues can you describe that reflect the tension between classical Republican ideas and those of natural rights philosophy? What position would you take on which of the philosophies if either should prevail? Explain what principles and values underlie your position. Please begin. Throughout American history, the government has exhibited qualities of both natural rights philosophy and classical Republican beliefs. The natural life rights philosophy gives people the individual right to pursue what they desire, whereas the classical Republican policy promotes the common good of the country collectively. The founders studied many uh, romantic philosophers, such as John Locke, who believed in the protection of the natural rights of life, liberty, and property, and Thomas Hobbes, who believed in sacrificing, uh, and who believed in sacrificing rights for the common good of everyone. The balance between the two philosophies has been an ever swinging pen pendulum. At our country's foundation, we leaned heavier towards nat natural rights. However, today we have embraced more classical Republican ideas holistically. The, there are definitely exceptions to this, and it is constantly swinging back and forth. The founders were very reluctant to create a strong central governing body, first creating the Articles of Confederation, which leaned towards states and their natural rights. The founders then created the Constitution, which heavily favored classical Republicanism. Yet, they were sure to clearly list the negative rights of the government in the Bill of Rights, keeping a balance between the two philosophies. In 1920, the 19th Amendment was ratified, giving women more natural rights. When the Social Security Act was passed under FDR, this was a huge shift towards classical Republican policy. The Civil Rights Act once again protected even more natural rights of African Americans that were being infringed upon. Although it is a balance, in your everyday life, you are more likely to come into contact with classical Republican policies. Things like minimum wage, selective service, driving laws, and public education makes up a larger part of what the American people sees Congress pass laws for, as they almost entirely pass positive rights laws. Although the country has more classical Republican sentiments than ever before, there are still many natural rights protected. We as a society are constantly becoming more accepting due to the easier spread of information on the internet. We are more willing to embrace what might once have been thought as fringe ideas. Things like marijuana, vaccinations, and assisted suicide are now topics we are considering adding to our natural rights. With some issues, the um, tension between the two philosophies is at the core of the, the debate, like with guns. The right to protect yourself how you wish is a natural right given by the Second Amendment, but the banning and regulation of some weapons prevents unnecessary violence, promoting the common good of all citizens. Complete outlaw of guns would leave citizens entirely dependent on the government to protect them, while complete deregulation of guns would lead to too much danger and violence, much like Hobbes' idea of a nasty, brutish, and short state of nature. Another issue with a lot of tension between the two philosophies today is health care. Health care for all would support the common good and classical republicanism. However, choosing when and how to receive this health care would be an individual right. The solution to these issues is all about finding a balance between the two philosophies. The issue of which policy should prevail comes down to what the topic is. When it comes to voting, all citizens should have the natural right to vote for their elected officials. Another issue we believe each citizen should have a natural right to is free speech. Some issues where we believe it is necessary to protect the common good are traffic laws and food regulations. For someone to claim they are either a natural rights philosopher or a classical republican alone, they would have, they would have to give up benefits of the other philosophy. If we only have natural rights, but no strong government to enforce these rights, we don't really have those rights. And if we only have strong classical Republican government, 
with no explicit rights, then our government has the capability to oppress and abuse its citizens. The balance of the two issues has been relevant since the foundation of our country and likely always will be. Neither philosophy on its own can solve all of our problems, but the compromise between the two can solve many of them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would you clarify for me which philosophers you associate with classical republicanism? Um, one, one major philosopher we heavily uh, associate is Thomas Hobbes with his Leviathan and giving up, uh, giving up some rights to this common good and to your government. There are a number of philosophers who would argue with you that Thomas Hobbes was the beginning of Enlightenment theory, set the foundation for John Locke's theories of government, that Hobbes is in the modern natural rights tradition with a solution to the excesses of natural rights and that we should be looking to philosophers like Plato, Aristotle, St. Augustine, St. Thomas to understand classical republicanism. Are those philosophers that you have encountered at all in your studies? How do they help to inform classical republicanism or, or terms that you would associate with classical republicanism? Yes, they definitely, we, we have encountered these philosophers and they definitely do um, have discussed a ton about the um, common good and the uh, natural, or excuse me, the classical republicanism. But but one thing that we saw that um, that we did why we did not bring them up is because we thought the, these philosophers mainly um, mainly talked about small city states and small civilizations, not as not an expansive and diverse a country as the United States. But Madison refers to them in explaining how, in a large extended republic, those classical principles can still be embedded into the constitutional system. Can you talk about that at all? Uh, or yeah, these. These classical republican ideals are still very strong in the Constitution. If, if that, that may have not been as clear as we wanted in our um, statement, but but it is very much a there is a lot of classical republican ideals as well as natural rights philosophies. So it, it is a balance between the two since our foundation. Sure, the state constitutions, the early state constitutions, they all contained this theory of a social contract, which of course is is part of that natural rights theory. So. So um, essentially, why were the colonists so interested in forming social contracts? I think that like what, um, um, so Rousseau said that in the um, uh, state of um, nature, that, um, uh, that man was, um, was um, better, but at, but, at, but at the same time, we, we, uh, we want the, the protection of um, government and when 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 the calls for uh, first arrived, like like with the Mayflower Flower Com Compact, they all joined 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 together, and pooled their own collective resources and um, uh, understanding to, to benefit all, which is a terrific example of, of the classical re Republican eye appeals that Ben was talking about. I think it was also important for the colonies to engage in a social contract because they sort of lacked that social contract with England at the time, because the things that England was doing to them they really didn't have any consent for, they weren't consenting to that. And it was important for them to include that consent in their own constitutions when they were formed. You made reference to voting, but then you talked about free speech in the natural rights part of your discussion. Talk to me about how government regulation of hate speech fits within that, that conversation. With 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 the Supreme Court case Schneck uh, v. U. v. United States, the um, uh, uh, definition of hate speech was was given to to be clear and and present dan uh, dan danger against a person or uh, or um, other groups. For me personally, I like that that definition of um, hate speech best. I think it's also clear that the government um, tries its hardest, certainly, to not protect against hate speech and makes that distinguish that distinction that hate speech and free speech are not the same thing, that when there is, as Grant said, a clear and present danger towards another group of people or what may have you, um, there is a clear difference between free speech and speech that is meant to harm somebody. Do you make a distinction between hate speech and seditious speech, or are they one of the same? In, in you're referring to Shank versus United States, for example. Uh, could you rephrase that? I'm sorry. Seditious, Seditious speech, speech versus hate speech. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think um, in in some cases things that are considered hate speech 
are not necessarily seditious speech. Right. And I think um, I think there are there are times when speech can be regulated, as seen as looking at like a case like Brandenburg v. Ohio. I think you can take from that that although we can't, and it is more the right to assembly in this case, but although we can't uh, abolish the right to free speech, there are time and place. I mean, we were at the Jefferson Memorial yesterday. It, it's, it, it says tranquility and, and quiet need to be here. So the government is saying, I mean, you don't necessarily, you can't come in here yelling hate speech and things. You, you can be removed, but your right to speak all over the place cannot be taken away. You want to follow up on that? On well, no. I, I have no okay. something else. Let me just get you back to um, your discussion about health care. Why is it that health care should be a government issue? And if you say, but it shouldn't be, why not? I think we see that it should be a government issue because when we leave it up to the individual companies, as we see today, you run into issues like where people can't afford their insulin monthly because the company set the prices so high. We need to um, have at least a little bit of government regulation so we ensure that people are getting their medications that they need to stay alive. Because what if I decide I'm not paying? I don't want to. It's my right not to pay. Why is the government going to get involved in that? Well, let's say from um, from something like um like um vaccinations, there are there are people who are who are o who are allergic to to the measles bag bag vaccinations, and, and and now because there are certain groups who are who are choosing not to get vaccinated, and um uh, there uh, uh, with all the measles out uh, outbreaks, these um uh, these these people are are at risk. So for the common good of of uh, everyone, like like in that issue, I I think you should. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you so much. For a little bit of feedback, I'll start. The text puts Hobbes in the modern political tradition. So when you say we're going to treat Hobbes as a classical philosopher, you owe us an explanation for that decision. Doesn't mean you can't do it, but you got some splaining to do because we associate typically from Unit 1 classical republicanism with wisdom, moderation, temperance, civic virtue, the common good, and so on. You've taken a, a very different approach to the question. You get to do that, but know that if you're going to take, be courageous enough to do that, you must explain why you're departing from sort of an established approach to, to thinking about things. Okay, that said, within the framework that you developed, you did a very nice job with it. Um, lots of good examples, lots of good explanation. So, nice job. Mm -hmm. I agree, uh, and I, I had the same idea there that, that Hobbes is really kind of more in the natural rights kind of area where, you know, human beings naturally uh, just go to their own individual interests and therefore it's the fear of being killed by somebody else who wants your stuff is what gonna, what's going to bring you into that social contract. So again, same thing, but, you know, just develop that and give us a reason why you're putting him in a different category. Um, but otherwise, really nice content, good presentation. Uh, you all know this stuff and, and you're able to own it and um, it was really nice to see you today, so thank you. Thank you. Part of why I didn't pursue the, the one question I was given the chance to was because I, there were multiple things that you brought up in your presentation that I really wish I was doing solo duty up here, so I could have had a lot of time to talk to you. <laughs> that, you know, when you made the comment about the Civil Rights Act, for instance, as in the protection of natural rights, I wanted so much to talk to you about whether, in fact, we didn't have governmental activity that limited rights of significant parts of the population, and whether we weren't just you know, doing lip service to some stuff, but that would have involved a whole bunch more time with my personal view of the world than it was you showing what you knew. So I avoided that. Wish Enjoy. We I'm sorry? Wish we could have. <laughs> well, thank you. We were happy to be here. Well, Grant, I'm going to ask your teachers would. for your number. I'm going to call you. <laughs> Listen, you all were really good. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.